version of the video version of the show is the hardest part of this whole thing. Mm-hmm. That's why I haven't done video yet. Yet. <laughs> yet. I said yet. yet. I, I said the word. I said the word. There you go. Welcome to a very special, I can say this correctly now, uh, Friday, second Friday edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. As you probably noticed, we released an episode at 8 o'clock this morning after saying we were not going to be on the air this week, but we had our first point of order uh, live stream that we are going to be uploading every Friday morning at 8 o'clock, so that came out. And now we thought we would just hurt the host even more by bringing in another guest this uh, beautiful Friday. I'm assuming it's beautiful as we record this Thursday night uh, to talk about the conservative leadership debate that took place Thursday night as we're recording this word, but an hour after the debate hosted by the Canada Strong and Free Network, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. former Manning Center in Ottawa with five candidates for the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership. They are Roman, Roman Baber, uh, yep. Scott Atkinson, Atkinson, I'm going to pronounce his name a lot wrong tonight. Atchison, so Scott, yeah. Scott, if you want to come on the show and correct me, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, John Chere, got that name right. Leslin Lewis and Pierre Polyev. Uh, they all squared off in about an hour and a half, two hour debate, it seemed like, or about an hour debate, was it? How long was it? That's your I don't know. It's, it started at 3.30 in the afternoon. Okay, and so it now ended, so at five. About two hours, yeah. Yeah. Hour so, and a half. Yeah, it's about an hour and a half and a little bit after an hour and a half. And we have our favorite political pundit who has a better backdrop than me sometimes. And yes, I'm going <laughs> to say that. Deirdre Mitchell McLean. McLean Mitchell. Well, how, I should have asked you before I don't know. this. You, you got everything but Deirdre. Deirdre, 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 Deirdre. Thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Happy to be here. <laughs> Are you after I pronounced your name wrong again? Deirdre, um, I want to start off with this. Initial reactions. I'll let you go first on the overall format of the debate and the the tone of the debate before we actually start talking about some of the candidates let's talk about the tone and the format of the debate uh, i'll let you go and then i'll uh, give some feedback there first so i i didn't dislike the format of the debate um i thought that like a few times when they were like oh everyone will get to speak like soon but that didn't really appear so that was unfortunate <laughs> but I mean, I thought it was I thought it was half decent. I thought the moderators did a decent job of of trying to quiet down some of the candidates that were louder and longer winded. <laughs> I wonder who that could be. <laughs> <laughs> the ones that just wouldn't shut up. I thought they did not a bad job. Now, I also have to say, uh, I, I got a comment afterwards about uh one of the one of the candidates and i said well you know this is kind of another thing is that i think the moderators are not necessarily neutral and i don't think they were trying to be neutral so no. uh you know and and then that's that's a benefit that you have of being a conservative and moderating at a conservative event with conservatives <laughs> But I, I, but I, I did think that it was fairly obvious who their choice was. Well, and I, I, I agree with that statement. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna add on to it a little bit here by saying that this was a debate for the party members. This was not yes. a debate for Canadians, which we're gonna see on the May, Mar May 11th, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. But this is a debate for the members. This was the red meat that the Conservative Party membership was looking for. Uh, I know they did hold a kind of town hall in Brampton, Ontario earlier this week, but this was the first one that was televised. Yeah. And I'm, what's the word I want to use here? I'm not shocked about how it went tonight. Because, like I said, it was the red meat that the base has been looking for, and it's gearing them up for the next four months of this leadership race. 
And it was the choir. They were literally preaching to the choir for this debate. I, I might be the only one that saw this, and correct me if I'm wrong, and the, this is just about the general atmosphere in the room. I found the response from the audience very tepid, didn't you? Yeah. Like I, That's Absolutely. what I was shocked about. I was shocked that, like, even when John Charest or Pierre Polyev were saying something that were very, like, that would rile up their base, all you got was the... And I was like, okay, well, where's the, where's the like hooping and hollering that we're all expecting from these debates? <laughs> well, and I think that could be a little bit of a testament to the fact that, that this is the choir. These, these people that are attending uh, the free, uh, Strong and Free Network conference are, let's say, um, they're the base. They are they are the base, but they're also let's say discerning. Um, so this isn't this isn't uh, Polyev's, you know, um, more freedom convoy type uh, where where people are going to get super excited because they really don't know what else is going on. But these are people that are like we're we're talking pretty engaged individuals that would have shown up in Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> and probably a lot of people who have already made up their minds as well. Yeah, yeah. And that was the big thing that I noticed that we'll talk about Candace here in a few seconds, but the one that instance that I saw and I noticed that there were some people in the audience that were for certain candidates over the others, you would have a candidate like Roman say, "We, we'll, I want to defund the CBC. You'd get a tepid response, and then two minutes later, Pierre would say, "I'm going to defund the uh, CBC," and it seemed like everyone in the room clapped. And I was like, "Okay," so I, I can tell who who who's brought out the people to this event and why they're doing so well. <laughs> yeah, and I think too, it's it's the the type of people that would, or not type of people, but the people who would attend the Strong and Free Conference, which I've actually done in Red Deer a couple of times. Um, when it was still the Manning Center, but I mean, they used to do one in, or still do one in uh, Red Deer in the fall and it's late fall. Okay, one year it was like sketchy getting from Calgary to Red Deer. <laughs> so, I mean, I wish they would figure out a better time to do that, but, uh, but I've been to them and it's, it, it's pretty much party well, somewhat party faithful. So that's another thing, right, is that you have the PPC, which has 100% really attracted a lot more individuals who would be your typical uh, Conservative Party of Canada voter. And so I think because of that, I mean, you, you have Polyev, who's basically... You know, if he if he didn't win, you can see him going the way of Max Bernier, maybe replacing Max Bernier <laughs> as the leader of the PPC. Like, I mean, these these guys are are really close yeah. as far as their ideology goes, and as far as their uh, their attitudes and personalities and how they're going to campaign during this. It's very reminiscent of Bernier. So twenty seventeen. Right. I think we've just officially not gotten Pierre on the show, so <laughs> by that statement. But I want to turn to the candidates because while on the show, we, we always try to stay positive and we always try to make sure that we put forward a positive footprint to say the good the good things that people have done. We will mention in this in the next few, uh, probably about 20 minutes and talking about all five candidates that were on the stage, some of the bad things that they probably said or put their foot in their mouth. And we'll talk about some of the knockout punches. So I'll just be up front. Um, this is our opinion. This is not anyone else's opinion. This is our opinion. This is our uh, viewpoints on how we viewed it as Albertans watching this strong and free network, uh, Canada strong and free network debate. So I just want to preempt that before anyone starts attacking us and saying that we're all hacks. Sure, okay, I could be, but I have a Stephen Harper sign, so that's kind of cool. Um, I let's start in alphabetical order because 
I think I want to start with the one that most people relatively, while he's been an MP since 2019, I don't think a lot of people know on that stage, and that's Scott, MP yeah. for Perry, Perry Sound Muskoka. He, as he mentioned in the debate, he was on the Heritage Committee. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that's a big claim to fame for a conservative, but he was on the Heritage Committee. Um, I was impressed by him tonight. So was I. I, I thought he... He was the adult in the room. Yeah. And that's saying something for having five people who are running to be Prime Minister of Canada <laughs> on that stage, and Scott sort of hits it out of the park by sort of being the calm, cool, and collected voice on the stage. Was there anything about his performance that you were really impressed with, or was it just that adult in the room mentality that he kind of kept going through there? You know, I think he was, like you said, he was calm, cool, collected. He was reasonable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we we don't get a lot of that in conservative politics these days, and it was it was it was lovely to hear. Um, and because I live tweeted it, I was mostly listening and not really watching. Yeah. So when I do that. Um, I tend to I tend to put a lot of weight on their voices and their tone, and you know I can I can figure out I can I can picture what's going on just by listening, right? Um, but I thought that Scott did a, a great job. I think that he, you know, he is the he's probably the type of leader that everyone who is absolutely exasperated and exhausted by politics is kind of like, please, God, can we just get someone who is reasonable? And, and he absolutely embodied that. Like, absolutely. But, okay, well, do you want us to keep positive or? <laughs> no, well, this, is, this is the time. So as I said, we're going to stay positive. We're going to stay, we're going to talk the positive, the negatives and the, where they need to go from here. So while we both agree that he was kind of the uh, voice of reason on the debate, yeah. let's be he honest. He rile up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that was, and that was a, <sighs> it was a sad thing to, and, and okay. So for me, yes, I was watching it, but for me to hear, right. I could hear the lack of response. I could hear uh, you know, how, how there wasn't any excitement at what he was saying. And of course, because reasonableness isn't exciting. It just isn't. <laughs> no. no, there's no chaos there. So as anyone who's listened to the show and followed along on our, our social media feed, my social media feed, um, you know that I've tried to go to all the events that the leadership candidates have, have had here in the city of Calgary. Scott is the only one who has not campaigned outside of the province of Ontario, uh, who has not left the province of Ontario since announcing his leadership bid. He is stuck in Ontario. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, while it's good to be the reasonable man, reason doesn't win votes out here in Alberta on a... <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that in a negative way, and I, I, I should correct that. Reason doesn't win when you're just talking on a debate stage in Ottawa, live streamed on YouTube. It just oh. doesn't work. You need to go where the meat and potatoes are. You need to come to Alberta. And maybe he's going to do a swing while he's out here in Alberta for the May 11th debate. But right. his I don't know where his base is. And I, that's what I've been trying to calculate over the last few weeks is What's his base? Is it Perry Sound Muskoka and that's it? <laughs> but also, how did he raise 300 grand? That's the other thing too. Yes. Right. Like there's there are there are people supporting him. He raised 300 grand. He got the 500 signatures from a minimum of was it 29? Yep. So I think 27 or 29 one or the other. Okay. So uh so the thing with the the leadership uh, race is that they not only have to come up with three hundred thousand dollars, they also have to have five hundred signatures from at least twenty-seven or twenty-nine uh, electoral districts in the country. So 
they he can't just get those from his own writing he has to be getting them from other writings and 500 people sign mm -hmm. so uh like i've i've i signed nomination papers let's <laughs> digress for half a second uh i didn't think that who did i sign for in 2020 i think it was marilyn gladue and then she went nutty after and i was like oh my god <laughs> i put my name on that anyway i was just like oh you need signatures like yeah i'll sign and and yeah then she went fucking nutty and i was like god damn it <laughs> well the, so you mentioned three hundred thousand dollars that they had to raise it was actually three hundred and sixty thousand because the party collected sixty thousand dollars in taxes <gasps> Shut up. <laughs> Not even joking. I had Joseph Rowe on the show and he said, no, it's not $300,000. It's $300,000, the $200,000 entrance fee, the $100, uh, the $100,000. Uh, Good behavior whatever. fee. Yeah, behavior fee. And then $60,000 of taxes. But of that, 30%, half of that $60,000 is actually goes to the party. The other part, the other part goes to the federal government. And I went, so you had to raise $360,000? He goes, yep. <laughs> That's amazing. Considering we just sat and listened to here, Polyev, yep, about taxes for the last like hour and a half. And his own party collected taxes on their behalf. That's awesome <laughs> found it hilarious i just think not a lot of people know this and i need to no. get the message out <laughs> <laughs> yeah that doesn't that should somehow be the title of this episode <laughs> get the get the message out three hundred sixty thousand dollars <sighs> oh, hey 360 there you go we go through a complete 360 here so i I, I'm just trying to figure out where his base is. And I, I go back to Scott here for a second because he might do well in the rural Ontario progressive conservative areas like Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Yeah. But I think he's going to. I, I have seen events on social media from Patrick Brown where he's talking to people. I've seen events where John Charest, Pierre, Roman, Leslin, all these people are talking to people. Every time I see something from Scott, it's him instead of in front of a green screen talking about some issue. And if we talk about candidates who need a little jolt of adrenaline to get through the next six months, maybe <laughs> John Sheree should give some of the energy that he had on stage tonight to Scott because whew, that was a he has a long six week six months ahead or five four however many months they are ahead of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I like, I think that Scott is, uh, Scott is, I think, you know, this year's Michael Chong. Yes, yes, yeah. I that couldn't agree more with that statement. Thank you, Mike. He is the Michael this Chong of this year. This is why you called me. Exactly, because you, you give, you remind me of people who ran in the past and who were supposed to run this time, but he didn't, he decided not to, good, good on Michael Chong, but Scott is the Michael Chong of this year. And I could not have said it better myself. I don't know what Scott's end game is here. Maybe it is to win the leadership. It looks highly unlikely. Maybe it's to be kingmaker. Maybe if Sheree wins, he becomes a uh, parliamentary leader in the House of Commons. I don't know. So Maybe it's he upsets some Patrick Brown, Jean Sheree vote. That's the other thing, too, right? And we're going to talk about John Sheree and uh, Patrick Brown here in a few seconds. But Scott is a enigma. And I can't wait yeah. to see him in person because you can watch a video. But until you see him in person, you don't get the raw raw that you might get in person. So we will see. Um, the next person I want to talk about is, and they kept on saying this, and I kept on yelling at the screen. And I, this this is the political nerd in me, uh, my audience. Uh, I apologize right here, right now about that. And that is former member of provincial parliament, Roman Baber. Baber. He is not yes. a sitting politician. He is not the member of provincial parliament for York Centre. The writ was issued 
So therefore, as of the oh, writ, right. yes. they are no longer sitting members. So as of May 3rd, stop calling the politician. <laughs> okay. Good reminder. Well, yet again, this is the cru- this is the crux I bear. <laughs> okay. I want to talk about Roman for a few minutes because he was here in Calgary and I was it was about 10 minutes before the event was about to start and I was the only one there. I thought I was in the wrong <laughs> location at first. Not even his people had arrived yet. <laughs> so I was a little concerned that I was in the wrong place, but then people started streaming in. We got the event going. They had about 45 people there for the event. And that opening and closing statement is the exact same statement he gave out here. (laughs) I was like, hey, I know I could I could repeat this. I could repeat this whole thing. I almost know all the words. Exactly. And <laughs> I give Roman credit because he is he is fighting an uphill battle. And talk about another person who has gained $360,000 and 500 signatures. People want him on the ballot. He is the voice of the anti-mandate, anti-restriction movement in the Conservative Party right now. Maybe that's where he's got his support from. But tonight on stage... Mm-hmm. He was there. <laughs> I I said I would always start with the positive. He attacked Scott a few times, which I still don't understand what that was all about. But he was on the stage. You can say that more than Patrick Brown. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> he attacked that was extremely a- positive. <laughs> Thank you. What did you think about Roman's performance tonight? Uh, you know, I I was a fan of Roman. Um, <clears throat> I'm not actually sure when it was, but he maybe he came out in 2020 saying maybe I'm going to run for the leadership, and I was like, "You sound like a you know common sense individual," but then obviously he was not. Uh, but but it. But that's, and that's actually his superpower is being a fairly reasonable sounding guy. He did not get overworked up. He, uh, you know, he was, he, he was reasonable. And I, I, again, I had somebody else go and say, what is with this guy? Cause it's like, he, he seems reasonable, but then all of a sudden, and I'm like, well, yes. So, um, uh, so I thought that he was also even keeled, you know, fairly, fairly good at, at addressing the questions. Okay. Apparently this is something we have to give kudos for, but also addressing the questions, <laughs> you know, giving an answer. And I thought that he was like, I thought he did quite well. Uh, the thing with fate, uh, Roman. Faber. <laughs> we'll just yeah, call him Roman. Rome. <laughs> Roman. We all know Roman. We uh, call him so Roman and you Mitchell McLean. <laughs> That's how I do it on this show. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing with so the thing with Roman is that uh <clears throat> as he mentions a number of times during the debate, he is an immigrant to Canada. Uh, I believe he moved when he was five. 15. So I I we, we uh, literally my husband he has and no I accent. Were, <laughs> he doesn't. Uh, my husband and I were looking at this because the first thing he asked me, and this is this is nothing to do with anything. My husband's Jewish, and this and he goes, "Is Babur Jewish?" And I said, "I don't know." So we looked on his Wikipedia page, which totally is totally real for everything. So I could be wrong here, but at eight years old, he left uh, the former Soviet Union. He moved to Israel until the age of fifteen. And then at 15, he immigrated to Canada in Mississauga. Okay. So that's... Okay. Yeah, so he has a... I mean, that's that's actually an interesting dichotomy. I'll just go out on a limb here and say something that could be horribly controversial. But he <sighs> went from a society of being oppressed to a society of we oppress. And then he came to Canada. I'm 
just to, saying. To a society that <laughs> oppresses our First Nations. Right. I mean, like, it's not like he left any sort of oppressive society, but apparently he's really against it. Um, but the thing is, with, 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 with Roman, uh, as much as he is very, very good at sounding like a very reasonable individual and making really good points, his premises, so I minored in philosophy because it was fun. Okay, I liked philosophy. I liked, I liked it. Anyways, I know that that is weird to some people who like, you know, things that are more concrete. Uh, but I, I like the whole uh, killing an argument and, and absolutely dissecting an argument. And it is piece by piece. And with Roman, you have someone that is very good at remaining calm and making good points but his premises are so flawed and that's why he starts speaking and, and he's very reasonable then all of a sudden he's off a fucking never never land and you're like how the sh how did we get there yep well we got there because his premise is that you know canada is russia soon like it's 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 a little mess but but he has this uh, but he does have that same calming demeanor that that Scott Aitchison does, so it so it's a little it's a little jarring in a way. I was at the Babber as I said at the beginning. I, I was at the Babber event here in Calgary at the Sandman Hotel. Uh, it was me and Rebel News who were there. We were the only two media organizations at the event. God bless it. Um, <clears throat> Everyone. It is the only time in my entire time covering politics since 2012 back in Ontario 2012 even before then when I was a good old beat reporter um where I've ever had an audience member boo a candidate who is there to actually <laughs> listen because during the event Roman said and this is the part where I went okay I give Roman credit here because he said I know people who have died from COVID and there were people in the audience who were not in the who were in the opinion that COVID is a hoax, and COVID mm -hmm. is exactly. So this woman, I'm she glad must this have been, is also a visual medium. Exactly, exactly. For those who are listening to this via audio, pause it and head over to YouTube. Subscribe. <laughs> this woman, probably in her sixties or seventies physically looked like she was going to vomit when he said that and went oh can't believe he's a one of those and i was like whoa oh. <laughs> i okay. didn't know what to say and yet again not a big turnout for the event but you could everyone could have everyone heard it <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love those moments <laughs> it was an event <laughs> um, uh overall though and yet again i think his strongest moment of the night is his sort of and i hate to say this his ability to attack people without attacking them but at the same time make it seem like don't vote for this guy vote for me because i'm truly the conservative and all these other people aren't he walked a very fine tight rope Mm -hmm. where he just looked like he was he was on stage to win knowing that he has a very slim chance because he said at the event in Calgary I will win if it goes to a second ballot well that's optimistic good for him <laughs> if he has if he has a path to victory on a second ballot or a third ballot good for him well okay okay actually uh Remember, these are ranked ballots. Yep. I uh, I haven't seen Patrick Brown yet. <laughs> Has but Patrick Brown seen of... Patrick Brown? <laughs> yeah. He's, a I... membership. He's busy. <laughs> exactly. He's, he's running <laughs> Brampton. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll we'll do our we'll do our projections after the first debate of who's going to be knocked off the list first. Yes. Uh, there may be a reason I brought that up during this part of the conversation. Okay. <laughs> I wonder. Anyway, continue. Um, 
Was there anything that stood out about Roman at the end of the day? Like, is there any moment where you can take away? For Scott, for me, it was, I was a mayor of a small town. I know leadership. I got to Ottawa. That was the moment for me. I went, Scott, that is the moment you became like a candidate for me. Mm -hmm. For Roman, I couldn't point to that one moment where I went, okay, you, you deserve to be on this stage. Yeah, no. Like there, there was really nothing. And yet nothing, again, it wasn't I, his not crowd. Really different. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't but his crowd. But that's but that's problematic because the people that are attending the Strong and Free Network conference are definitely voting. <laughs> really? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like not your crowd, but those those people are definitely voting. And he was absolutely not um, not a favorite. But again, like we kind of talked about the ambiance within that room that we thought that it should have been a little more uh, energetic, a little more excitement because these are like these are their people, right? Yeah. These are these are the people that are going to these are the meat lead and the conservative people. party. Yeah, yeah. So so Many. it was it was a little bit weird. Um, I want to just take a moment here and ask you one question, because my husband and I had a running joke the entire time the debate was on. Uh, <laughs> I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I will be the first to admit that every time I saw Jason Kenny on the screen, I wanted, I screamed at the top of my lungs, shot, because I wanted to take a shot every time they panned <laughs> to former Premier Mike Harris of Ontario and Jason Kenny being chummy chummy with each other. The moment he came onto the screen for the first time, Ricardo, my husband, turned to me and said, shouldn't he be trying to win his own leadership race before <laughs> going to Ottawa? And I said, not my issue, not my issue. Uh, so, thankfully, not a recovering alcoholic at this time because I <laughs> am not sure if I could follow as closely as I do <laughs> and, and not have a beverage after were you surprised he was there? Well, yeah. Well, okay. No. Uh, I didn't even know he was not, leaving not the surprised. province. Not surprised. Uh, it's the week. or It's not the weekend. Oh, but uh, QP is over. But still, he would have had to have left earlier than this. Yeah. I mean, that started at 3 o'clock in the afternoon here. So He, he was on the plane this morning. Days. No. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean... <sighs> surprised yes and no i mean he has been involved in each of the leadership races and he has knocked on doors in ontario still kind of amazing because anyone who's like yeah let's let jason kenny in here is not aware of what the fuck is going on because jason kenny's not a popular guy in no Alberta. matter what side of the conservative spectrum yeah. you're on he's not a popular guy he either, you know, he's he's too he he was too lenient by caving to the left, or he was not lenient enough. And uh, he's he's know, between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, absolutely, because that's what happens when you try to unite a party <laughs> that should not be united. They don't want the same things, yep. anyways. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we go on, I need to take a quick commercial break because we do have to get paid by our sponsors. So we will be right back after this quick 30 second, or for you, it will seem like 30 seconds for us. It's probably going to be about two minutes. So uh, two 30 second commercial break. So we'll be right back after this quick message. And we'll be back to talk about Dr. Leslie Lewis, Pierre Polyev, and John Charest after this quick message. Come celebrate Calgary's favorite cocktail. Calgary Caesar Fest is taking place on May 19th and 20th right here in the birthplace of Canada's official national cocktail. As listeners and viewers of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown, you will receive 20% off your tickets when you use the promo code CBI Caesars. That's C-B-I Caesars, all one word. Just visit CalgaryCaesarFest.com and get your tickets today. Welcome back. Uh, 
we are back after that great commercial break by one of our sponsors. Head over to Eventbrite and go get your tickets to the upcoming Caesar Fest here in the city of Calgary. It's going to be a fun time. I'll be there. I'm not going to drink, but I'll be there. Um, let's talk about the last three candidates that were on the stage, and then we'll wrap up with the one that wasn't on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with Dr. Leslin Lewis. Um, this is her second kick at the can of the leadership. She ran in 2020 against Aaron Latoul, Peter McKay, and Derek Sloan. Mm -hmm. She stuck to her guns tonight. She mm -hmm. said what she said, and she said what she believes, and you can't hold it against her for her views on what she believes in, because she, she has said the exact same thing here in Alberta that she said that night, tonight, or, well, yesterday, if you're listening to this on Friday, or Thursday night's debate on the 5th, uh, then I give her credit. I give her credit for sticking to her guns. She is becoming the stronger candidate every time she speaks and says the exact same thing. So I give her credit. Yep. The issue is that means squat when the media is not paying attention. And she took shot after shot after shot at the legacy mainstream media tonight. Mm -hmm. And that's going to rile her base up, which is great. It's going to rile up people in Alberta. Do you believe she is on a path to potentially taking a lot of that social conservative vote away from the other candidates that they are trying to get for that first ballot? Actually, what's your thoughts on what she, how she did tonight? Let's start with that before I go into the deep dive. I, 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 thought, I thought that she was very strong. I think yeah. stronger than she was in 2020 in the debates for sure. Yep. I was surprised that she went after Polyev. Mm -hmm. I did not expect that. I had, I mean, I think that Polyev is at a disadvantage because I was reading something earlier today that basically said he will not go after her. Okay. Well. <laughs> so Point Lewis? <laughs> She she's figured that out, and she knows that she can say whatever she wants about him, and all he has to do is then turn to John Charest and say, "Liberal, you're a liberal." <laughs> yeah, yeah. It. Uh, I, but I th I thought I thought she was strong. Yeah. I thought that she was, again, much stronger than she was in 2020. I think that, you know, in 2020 it seemed like there was more of she was no, a nobody in 2020, let's be honest. Yeah, she was, but she was also, um, I guess, I mean, not knowing anything of the behind the scenes between 2020 Leslie Lewis and 2022 Leslie Lewis, I think that she was trying to build her profile in 2020 and uh, basically picked the hardest thing to do, which you got to respect. Um, if you want to learn, you do the hardest thing first. Yep. And obviously, I would say that she learned from 2020. So she did. When I was at her event here in Calgary, 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 Calgary. I just Calgary. Green. It's Healthy. been one of those days. It's been one of those days, guys. Okay. <laughs> I know it's only 10 o'clock for those who are listening to this live right now as this goes out, but for me, it's been a long day. Um Leslin, Leslin riled up the crowd. I have never seen like I've been to a lot of them. Yet again, let's just take Pierre's event out of the woodwork because he's the hometown boy. But she riled up her crowd and she had people basically eating out of the palm of her hand. When people are in front of Leslin, Leslin can talk and she can engage with people that I've never seen in some politicians. There are some politicians out there who are just in it for the paycheck. She knows how to how how to capture. And tonight you saw that, but I don't think it did her any good because. 30 seconds, you can't get your message across. That's the one bad thing about those debates is 30 seconds to respond. Well, what am I supposed to say in 30 <laughs> seconds? That everyone can understand because I'm not talking that fast. Exactly. That's the other thing, too. 
if and I I can I, say a lot in 30 seconds, but if I want you to follow along with me, I can't say as much. <laughs> what I found very interesting, and this might be just me looking too much into it, no one interrupted her. Everyone was nice to her, if I'm not mistaken. Did Roman? No, I think actually uh, Sheree was probably the only one, but he he technically offered her, you yeah. know, do you, do you want to take it? And she kind of waffled a bit and he was like, okay, I'll do it. Um, but that was, but I think he, he was the only one, right? And, and I like to see a little bit of deference uh just because of the dynamics that are on that stage um you, you know have... as much as these guys as much as these guys say that they may not be uh you know might not give a damn about the lefty uh optics they obviously do cuz none of them wanted to be that guy yeah Exactly. And there were so many opportunities to be that guy. <laughs> You're not going to win by playing Mr. Nice Guy. Peter McKay played Mr. Nice Guy. I saw how well that yeah. went. Maxine Bernier played Mr. Nice Guy. Well, yeah, kind of. Let's say Aaron O'Toole in 2017 played Mr. Nice Guy. We all saw how well that played <laughs> over. For those who are li listening to this by audio, we almost had our very first spit take <laughs> on the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. <laughs> <laughs> over the fact that Maxine Bernier was a nice guy possibly in 2017. <laughs> Didn't think that would be funny, but there we are. Oh, I want to talk, I'm going to let you decide who we talk about next. Who out of the last two do you want to okay, talk? Okay, no, no, wait, no, no, wait. Oh. I still get to comment on Lois and Lewis. Oh, okay. Oh. I, I didn't do the but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so those were the good things, but what would you have to say so, about what, where she needs to potentially get a little bit more? Oh, well, okay. So, I mean, Leslie Lewis is a staunch pro-life candidate. Mm -hmm. She is true to her principles and her values. This was just a bad week. To be that person was it though okay and, and, and i mean I it was, say, it was, I, I it was a that. good thing oh, go ahead it's a good thing if and and this is a big if it's a good thing to be that person if you had even remotely close to a majority of people behind you and you do not okay yeah I'm gonna say this now. I'm gonna I'm gonna give my butt to that statement that you just are gave. You, are you gonna make me throw something? Because I you could. you might <gasps> pro life pro birth Canadians vote. Mm -hmm. Pro life pro birth candidates. But court. they they are less than ten percent of the population. But less than 1% of the population will vote in this leadership election. Oh, for sure. Like, so absolutely. That, so this is, this, is my, this is my statement. And this is we, where can, I, we can talk about that amazing part after, though. <laughs> okay, continue on then. Go ahead. Continue on. So, if you're a woman yep. in Canada who may have at any point in time in your life ever thought what if i had to choose then watching what is going on in the u.s and been watching what's been going on in the u.s for like two years like they've been slow it wasn't even chipping away it was actually uh here's the here's was, the chainsaw it was, it was taking a jackhammer to yeah. the right like they they've been they've been incredible to watch and as much as some leaders, Jason Kenney was one who said, this is not a problem here. This is not an issue here. <laughs> oh, dude. Read the um, room. <laughs> yeah. So like this, this was a rough, this was a rough week. And while I respect the fact that Leslie Lewis is very confident in saying that she wants to roll back abortion, uh, period. 
right? Just period. It's not even rights. It's just period. She wants to get rid of like a lot of it. And, and that's, I respect the fact she's honest enough to say it, but also <laughs> don't know how well that went over. Um, she, as I said, she was very strong. She was very, um, uh, I want to say dedicated to what she was saying. She was committed to it. But like we, we talked about the, the, the clap, clap, clap. You know, Leslin didn't get a lot of excitement as, as you would have thought as well, again, from the choir. So we will. I'm not, I'm not saying she doesn't have support. She absolutely has yes. support. Can she build the support? for her particular cause within the next the CPC's <laughs> membership. Yes. But when she talks about, you know, actually even when she said, well, I know about, you know, being a new immigrant to Canada. And then she was like, I know about student loans and I know about working and teaching and going to school. And it's like, that's really not exactly a new immigrant issue. <laughs> like, like been there, done that. Canadian, <laughs> always it, been here. Yeah. We all have that problem. So, so it kind of so that missed the mark for me because it was like, how is that different than than what everybody else is going through? One thing that I found very interesting, and she didn't mention it on stage tonight, but she mentioned it down in the the southeast when she was here in the city, and that is. She knows where the party failed in the last election. It was the urban voters. It was the mm -hmm. downtown yeah. core. Now, we might be in a microcosm here because of Alberta, but if you go downtown Vancouver, you go downtown Montreal, particularly Montreal and Quebec City, you go downtown Ottawa, not right now because of the second Freedom Convoy, go downtown Toronto, I don't see a social conservative movement being able to attract voters. It might even repel voters, wouldn't it? It always has in the past. Well, that's true. That's true. That's, well, like, that, like, that's the thing. Like, this, this I'm an unapologetic conservative thing. It's like, I we, know unapologetic conservatives. And even they are like, can you please stop talking about this shit? Because this is repelling voters. Yeah, and the more the more we talk about social issues uh, in the conservative race, the worse it gets, right? I, I read a good tweet. I, I, I don't know who it was from. I think it was from a pundit back in Ontario. It might have been Alberta. It might have been Dwayne Brad, if I'm not mistaken. Especially how much I actually pay attention to what the Twitter says. Um, Tonight's debate is goldmine for any liberal war room in the next election. Every one of them got, gave something to attack a future leader on. And I looked at them, I, I looked at the tweet and I went, didn't look at the name, but looked at the tweet and I went, yeah, you're right. Like, this is the Michael Ignatius. This does. <laughs> this is the Michael Ignatieff, Stefan Dion. We didn't get it done on the environment in our 12 years here. And Stephen Harper used that in every election in 2000, 2008. Right? <laughs> so this is, this is the thing is that people are still adjusting to the fact that this isn't private anymore. Yeah. Right. Like this is, this is something and, and no offense to conservatives, but they seem to take a while to pick up on this stuff. So in 30 years, when the conservatives figure out this is being live tweeted and decide to do something about it, and I wish I could say that that's a 100% a joke, but it's kind of not because, because if you watch conservative politicians, it's like, we hate the NEP, and then 50 years later, they're like, we want an NEP. Dude. <laughs> Sheree did have, that was a good line from Sheree <clears throat> tonight. I will give him that. He well, did yeah. he did hit Pierre hard on that. 
And that's the reason why we left the best to well, the semi. Actually, you know what? We're not going to leave. We're not going to talk we about did. those two no, right we now. We left the best. <laughs> We're going to talk about the guy who wasn't there tonight. Because I want to, I, I'm trying to figure out what that play was. Where was Patrick Brown? Patrick Brown, where's your campaign? And I hate to be the guy who's yelling on the soapbox right now to my to my followers and my listeners from across Canada and for some reason Australia and the United Kingdom. Patrick Brown, are you in Australia and the United Kingdom right now? Because you doesn't seem like you're running for the conservative leadership. It seems like you're just running for the membership of the conservative leadership. I don't know. Um, VP of membership. Yeah, there you go. The, the <laughs> vice president of membership for the Conservative Party of Canada under insert leader's name here. What is what is Brown's? What is Patrick Brown's? Actually, I'm going to clarify that. What is Patrick Brown's play here? Why did why wouldn't have he shown up? Does, does okay. he does he see no skin in the game, or do the Conservative Party mm. in Ontario just hate him that much? Uh, the only skin in the game for missing tonight's debate is number one. Um, it it is the it's it's the base looking for the red meat. Yep. Right. So there is that. He doesn't have to play that game. He's there to hate. Okay. Him. Because because there is there is a bit of a game to it, right? Like when you're talking to when you're talking to people who you know are voting conservative you generally will have a different tone right so he avoided that what he also got was the ability to look at every single one of them and say where are their weaknesses he he got to do a little off of research the fact that he missed it as much as i want to say that that was a that it wasn't a great move uh, this it doesn't really matter it was broadcast on YouTube by okay. True North. <laughs> okay, hold on two seconds. Hold on two seconds. Did anyone else not catch the little sponsored by at the end of the debate? Sponsored oh. by Meta, Facebook? Oh, yes, I did see that act. Or I did. I, I heard it. Yes, because I wasn't watching. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> hold on a second. That's you're right. t you're telling that. me the Candace free strong and free network conservative movement is buddy buddy with Facebook now? <laughs> really? <laughs> I no, like is is the next really one really about freedom? Is the next one going to be sponsored by Elon Musk and Twitter? Like Hey, Elon, if you're listening to this, call me up. We'll sponsor a leadership debate. Downtown we have sponsorship County. available. There you go. <laughs> I, I I was shocked by that. I was honestly taken back. And they said it so lightly that it was like, okay. They did. It actually, it, it just, it, it kind of went over here. Remember I said I had to order pizza and I had to do some other things right afterwards. But I did, like I heard it and it actually... It did not register, so. Yeah. So let's talk about the big two in the room. The big <laughs> two, the final two of the night. The the most fireworks of the night, too. I'm going to let you. Who do you want to talk about first? June 2nd is Election Day in Ontario. Ontarians from Windsor to Ottawa, Toronto to Thunder Bay will be heading to the ballot box and electing their next provincial government. During the month of May, though, the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown will be in Ontario covering the election for our show, with interviews with undecided voters, candidates for office, and political pundits across the spectrum. We have you covered for this biggest election of 2022. Now you can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite shows. Or if you're like me, watch the show online via YouTube. Uh, let's um. Let's go with Pierre. Okay. No, <laughs> do you want to go Sheree first? Either well, kind of either or, right? Because there's there's uh. 
Let's go, let's start with Sheree. Let's start with the former premier of Quebec, okay. former minister, uh, former minister of environment under Brian Mulroney, former member of parliament for the great riding of Sherbrooke. I'm assuming I've never been, but I'm assuming I've heard great things because he was the member of parliament there. And the former uh, consultant on the Hawaii, 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 the 5G network here in China. Oh. <laughs> Huawei. 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 <laughs> um, this was the first time I've seen John Shrey live debate. Mm -hmm. I was like, I remember the 97 election. I don't remember it that well when he was the leader of the progressive conservatives and he went, went up against Preston Manning, which is kind of ironic that he was at a Manning event. And uh, jo John Cretchen and Audrey McLaughlin. So this was the first time I'd actually seen him perform live because I never paid close attention to Quebec politics during his time as premier. I was impressed. I've never seen that man fired up like these like these events that he's holding. Like he's not showing emotions tonight. He showed some emotion and it hopefully riled his base up a bit. But I was kind of impressed. I was uh, so full disclosure. Remember that I worked for Western Standard for a bit? Yep. For Derek Hildebrandt, yeah. And there was, because that was in 2020, and there was some rumors that Jean Charest might run in 2020. And I was super excited. I was super excited. Because of the fact that, I, I think because of everything he articulated tonight, that he has... He's been through dealing with uh, separatist sentiment, and in twenty, in twenty twenty, in twenty twenty one, in twenty nineteen, twenty nineteen was when the separatist movement seemed to really take off in Alberta. So it was election night, and I don't know how many invites I got on election night when Trudeau won again to join the Wexit freaking movement and I watched that thing grow within a week and it was just like what the <laughs> now the Maverick Party if for those who don't right? know the Wexit movement yeah, rebranded itself as the <clears throat> uh, Maverick Party which is going through its own leadership phrase right now that's concluding on May 14th we will be there covering the event live as the announcements of the next leader of the Maverick Party is announced and also, just to be a heads up, we'll probably talk about that on our point of order weekly show as well. So there you go. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, okay. Way so to pay attention to the races. show that you're on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but I mean, normally I get the emails. And, yeah. Uh, and, Dariq yeah. El Nalga is running. He's the former candidate from Banff Airdrie in the riding who ran against Derek Sloan and Blake Richards, and then uh, Colin oh, Party. Maverick, Maverick Party. Oh, oh. And then Colin Krieger, <laughs> way to pay attention. Colin Krieger ran. <laughs> this is this is this is why we do things late at night because we are both exhausted <laughs> as hell and we're trying to keep a coherent sentence together about politics. Okay. Um, and then Colin Krieger up in Peace River Westlock is running as well, and he ran for what? The Maverick Party in 2019 as well. <laughs> 2021, sorry. In 2021, he ran. So okay. they are two candidates who are running. They are going to replace, if they're two candidates that are running, of course, the two candidates that are running. Uh, they're going to replace Jay Hill, the former cabinet minister under government house leader under Stephen Harper as leader of the Maverick Party. So that's going to conclude on the 14th. But let's get back to John Sheree here for a second because All right. oh. John the Sheree. Is, I ahead. was a fan. I was yeah. a fan in 2020 of the possibility he might run. And the reason is because although I have a lot of liberal leanings, I do also have a lot of conservative leanings because Alberta, like everything we do is freaking conservative. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, but Jean Charest, the reason I liked the idea of him running in 2020 is because, because we actually do need someone to unite. I mean, there has been a lot of division sown 
and it was done purposely and but the thing is i mean as far as alberta goes and maybe saskatchewan too i couldn't actually say because i wasn't raised in saskatchewan i don't live there now but like we were raised with this western alienation thing that that is something that has really been taught to us all our lives so to have someone who says i understand what that might be like i understand how to unite despite this i really would like to see that because i'm so sick of the separatist movement and so i like jean charret i really like jean charret i like his i would i would love it if he could just squash every single separatist out there <laughs> hey everyone has the right to their opinion and that's the great thing about our united country is everyone has their right to their own opinion um we may not agree with them all the time, but at the same time, they have the right to stand up and do what they wish, as long as it's not hurting anyone else at the end of the day. Right. Okay, fine. So he doesn't squish them, he just encourages them to not be separatists. There you go. <laughs> Which he could, because he did. He had a good line tonight. I will make the Bloc Quebecois irrelevant, and I will, I will. Squish. I will retire them. Uh, yes, I am I, their retirement plan. Yes, that was a good <laughs> line from him tonight. Yeah. Um, the bad about John Charest, John Charest doesn't know how. John Charest. Well, not even that <laughs> on that stage. I was gonna say more that he doesn't know how to play in the sandbox anymore. I think he's been out of politics a long time where he's trying to play the 1997 campaign where he gained seats. And this is like, he brought a spoon to a knife fight tonight. And that was the bad thing about the whole thing. He had good lines, but there was nothing of substance that I can go away tomorrow and say, hey, did you see John oh. Charest do this? Did you see John Charest uh, articulate what he would actually bring to the table as prime minister because i but, saw that but here's the thing here's the thing here's the thing this is this is this this is where's the sound bite where's the sound bite of tonight because every time pierre got on the stage i know we're going to talk about pierre here in a few seconds every time pierre got on the stage he pivoted to his sound bites gatekeepers freedom gatekeepers he knows how to he knows how to win the soundbite, and that's what you need to do. John Shray does not know the soundbite because he's used to the traditional media of I'm gonna say 15 minute thing and he, they're gonna cut it down into two minutes and then everyone's gonna watch it on global news tonight. No one's watching global news. Okay, not no one. There are still a lot of people watching global news. But not as much <laughs> as they were in ninety-seven. Oh no. <laughs> I hate that you're right about this, but you actually, but you are a hundred percent right about this. Like, it's a different, it's a, it's a different battle. Yeah. And as much as, as much as I, as much as I like Sheree because of his experience, because of what he articulated tonight, because of, because of answers that couldn't be reduced into a freaking tweet. That's not what's going to trend on social media. No. Nope. And that's not, not what's going to be shared in a meme. And that's not what's Shit. going to, and that's not what's going to be talked about on More. Rebel News or Post Millennial or True North or even uh, Western Standard. That's the issue. You like, I can't take a clip out of anything, John. Sh I, actually, that's untrue. There's one thing that I will take a clip out. And that, thing. that, but also his attack on Pierre over Bill 21. Yes. That was yes. a, I couldn't believe, like he was pissed at that. And yes. I was Is shocked. It really about freedom. Exactly. That was the issue. And that one is. One sound bite. We have one. Okay. <laughs> one is not as good as what Pierre did tonight. But anyway, that's, let's hear it over there. 
let's talk about the man, the man who is the perceived front runner of this race. As much as some people who I've talked to in our in our close circles does not agree with that, let's let let's have that conversation. Pierre did what Pierre needed to do tonight, and that's all he did. Yep. He came in and he didn't screw up. Exactly. And and this is how everyone needs to frame this leadership race: is that it is Pierre's to lose. Yep. Well, that's what it was. Hey, it was uh, Peter McKay's to lose. It was, I was going to say Maxine Bernie again, but I caught myself and I said it was Aaron <laughs> O'Toole's to lose in 2020 or 2017. No, wait, Aaron O'Toole wasn't in 2017. He was. I mean, well, okay, actually, he may have been, but he did not make it far. He Andrew made... Shear? No, it, it, people want, the caucus wanted Aaron O'Toole. More people uh, supported Aaron O'Toole than Shear. The issue with Aaron O'Toole in 20... Yeah, I've done the research, girl. (laughs) If you got the numbers, I believe you. (laughs) Um, There's never been a candidate who has won leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada since Stephen Harper that has won with the most caucus endorsements. Think about it. Who is caucus endorsing that isn't actually winning? So... In 2017, Aaron O'Toole got the most caucus endorsements. He lost to Andrew Scheer. In 2020, Peter McKay had the most caucus endorsements. He went on to lose to Aaron O'Toole. Pierre Polyev, Polyev has the most caucus endorsements. Is he going to break that streak? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying. What it doesn't the, what, look good. Exactly. <laughs> I, I'm just saying what people are saying. I'm just putting. The, I'm just saying what people are saying. <laughs> It's my show. I say what I want to say. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. What did you think about Pierre, though? Let's mm-hmm. let's start with the good first. We talked about how he didn't screw up, which was a win. It's kind of okay. like that 2015 Justin Trudeau leader uh, federal campaign. He got on stage with Thomas Mulcair and Stephen Harper, and he didn't screw up, so he won. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh so, I mean, Polyev is how old? Is he actually 38 years old? I thought he was like 45, 46. No, no, he's younger than that. I'm going to say 38. And he's, not, that... he's not in his 30s, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, this is the it's important. 42, <laughs> 1979. He is 42 years okay, of age. So he's 42. All right, that oh okay, so so he's 42 years old, and when he went after Sheree with the how much did Huawei pay you? And then when Sheree went to answer, <laughs> and Pierre's like, How much? How much? How much? How much? And he sounded like a goddamn four-year-old, and I wanted to kick him. And yeah, no, no, four year olds are annoying. No, okay, um, <laughs> I want to talk about that for a second because that was the moment I realized that's how you beat Pierre. Is by Pierre, being a toddler? No, Pierre does that in the House of Commons every week. Yes, <clears throat> see, that's Pierre, what I, I was like. This is not the House of Commons. Exactly, this Pierre was QB. trying to. Pierre was trying to attack him like he could get his 30 second clip, put it on YouTube that night. But the thing is, John Charest didn't hold back either. He just kept on going at and it pissed Pierre off. I think it was the only time throughout the night that Pierre looked upset that he wasn't getting the straight answer that John Charest should technically be answering every question that I put to him. And it looked like for a moment that Pierre was getting frustrated that he was talking over top of him because during question period, it's ask question, answer, ask question, answer. During that exchange, it did not look good for Pierre. No, no. And it like, and I, again, let's just, let's just throw in a disclaimer here that I actually want to hear people talk about things that matter. Yeah. So when I hear somebody like, 
you know, pushing on that crap that I don't care about in the first place. And, and that is 100% true, right? I, I, I don't care what this guy did for a job in the same way that, you know, I know that people who are currently working for the United Conservative Party used to work for pro-life groups. It's a job. I realize you have to like, you know, pay the bill, uh, pay the mortgage. Right. And, but also probably agree with it because I couldn't do that. So, but the thing is that, that it is a job. You are literally being paid to do this. So I'm not going to put too much stock into that. <laughs> know what that means. I have a question from the <laughs> representative from Calgary Falcon Ridge and the riding of cross quarter interviews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This might just be me thinking way too much into this. For a candidate who has been spewing freedom, 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 do you not get the freedom to choose who you work for? You do, and like I said, you have to agree generally with the thing. However, you know, people will do some pretty unsavory things to get a paycheck. Oh, God, so, yes. God, yes. You know, that's a, that, that is still an option. I won't rule that out. I, I just assume that there are people who get jobs that they actually want. I am surprised, and I will be the first, I, my husband is the one, and I should give him credit for this statement. I am surprised no one brought up the niqab ban from the 2015 election. Sheree tried. I know, but he he, should, he, he went with yeah. He didn't he didn't go there. He went with a uh, barbaric cultural practice snitch line. Yeah, and Bill 21, but he should have yep. went hard because how are you going to attract voters in downtown Toronto? In Ottawa, in downtown Vancouver, in Montreal, in Quebec. Ban. Yeah, when you haven't publicly apologized, but people on your own campaign have. I think that's, I, I honestly think that's what Sheree was trying to pin on on Polyev in that, in that last. Uh, if you do not think. Between the two of them. If you don't think Patrick Brown is not going to do that on the 11th. He has. He will basically set up the dart and throw it right at bullseye, smack dab onto the Pierre's nose, because this is his. This is his issue because he needs the new Canadian vote to win this, and he is going to attack like there's no tomorrow. I'm. Gonna, you're going to see a groundhog with Patrick Brown. That's just me there. That's I'm fine. going to see selfies with Patrick Brown. Just saying. <laughs> Welcome Ninja. to Alberta. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. As long as he doesn't wear a cowboy hat like Aaron O'Toole did when he came to Alberta during the stampede during 2021, I will be okay with that. <laughs> I prefer when they don't do cosplay, but at the same time, I also dress up for poker on Fridays. I just want to say <laughs> that I overall, I thought it was a good debate. Yeah. I am relatively impressed with the candidates even if i don't agree with them and that's and that's like that's the big thing i really disagree with leslie lewis on a lot of things i never want to see her in a position of power i'm upset she was even elected however did she perform well absolutely polyev i think he's riding on the coattails of something that people think is something else that that's what happened with the cpc as soon as they merged as soon as they became one party a lot of people were elected who wouldn't have been elected under the other signs right polyev is a kid from the reform party he would not have been elected in suburban ontario with a reform sign it wouldn't have happened so again i thought it was i thought it was a decent debate uh, Polyev is obviously the front runner. I think that Sheree has the opportunity to really woo voters. Leslie Lewis, <clears throat> I don't, I mean, in an upset, she could absolutely, you know, win. However, 
she's also the representative of the social conservative part of the party that says, I'm still here, stick with us. It, I, I thought it was, I thought it was a good debate. I thought it was well done. I thought pretty much all of the candidates did well. I have my own issues individually with some Which, of them, but. Yeah, and I agree. It was a well-organized debate. It was something that I think a lot of people were looking And I need for. to see Patrick Brown. Yes, that yes. is what I'm looking forward to on the 11th, <laughs> is to see right. all six candidates up on stage actually answering questions. Now, the moderator for that debate is former Global National uh, Correspondent Tom Clark. I am so looking forward to that because Tom Clark is well-respected in a lot of circles. So I think it's going to be an interesting debate where he is going to hopefully hold some of these candidates to, debate, uh, to account. The fact that there's only six of them, it's going to be great. Uh, I hope it's a little bit... So um, much better than 17. That was nasty. I hope it's a little <laughs> bit better structured, though, at the end of the day. I did not like the rigidness of the 30 seconds. Okay, two minutes <gasps> for rebuttal. I hope it's more that one-on-one -on -one debate where they have time to actually argue over a topic, like how safe. So you're, and, you're saying they need to do a podcast then? Yes, they need to come on the show. <laughs> <laughs> come on the show. We're here. We're here all summer. I know my role. <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. This has been, I, I know, as I, I told her this morning, I told her this afternoon as we were watching this that, hey, do you want to come on the show? We'll probably be an hour. I know it's about an hour and a half, almost going on to two hours here soon. But I just want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. And I want to thank you for asking because, you know, I spend my time doing this. I need to expel that. Well, expel <laughs> all over my show. Um <laughs> So before we go, I do want to take a moment and say this, as I've said this in many of other episodes and a lot more throughout this month. May is Brain Tumor Awareness Month in Canada and the United States. Um, we are raising money to uh, go towards the Brain Cancer Foundation, Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. All money raised on the show during the month of May will be going to that foundation. So if you want, if you have $2, $5, $6, $1, uh, please donate to the show and all the money that is raised during the month of May will be donated. Hence why I'm wearing the good old gray ribbon on the hat tonight that is the brain tumor awareness ribbon uh please 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 uh look into it as you know i have been struggling with a tumor for the last two and a half years and it is still there unfortunately it is still a thing that i have to live with it day by day it is getting worse but here we are i want to thank everyone for tuning in listening to this uh and uh, we will be back monday morning for a full week of new episodes, we will be back Wednesday night after the May 11th debate in Edmonton of the Conservative leadership. Hopefully, we will have our guest on tonight who will come back on if she's so inclined to up in Edmonton. We'll get on the ground reporting from Edmonton, Alberta. <laughs> so with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, oh, should be mentioned, where can they follow you? At Mitchell underscore AB. There you go. Highly, highly recommend it. Go scroll down to the show notes, click on the notes, and you will be there. Um, so with that, without further ado, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, get out from behind social media unless you're following Mitchell AB. And just, just have a conversation with somebody. Just have a conversation with someone. So with that, thanks so highly much. Highly recommend it. Talk to you guys later. <laughs>